give you a little bit of background on how this country was by telling you where I was and what happened the first day of World War II when the United States was, became part of it. Uh, as you know, we were not in World War II for the first couple of years. It started in 1939, and we didn't get in until the end of 1941. And it, it, it's kind of interesting to note that the country was totally against going into World War II. The overwhelming percentage during surveys showed that the American people wanted nothing to do with World War II. They wanted to help those who were battling against Hitler and against the Japanese fascists. And so that by and large, a, a large percentage wanted to send support to those countries, give them arms and so on. But to get into the war, this country wanted nothing to do with it, and overwhelmingly so. Which meant that when we did go to war, you suddenly had a weird situation in which you had people that didn't want to have any part of a war, and suddenly they were in the middle of it. And so let me just give you some concept of how Americans thought in those days. I happened to be at the polo grounds in New York City on the day that we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Uh, the New York Giants were playing the Brooklyn Dodgers. When I tell that to old ball fans, they say, whoa, wait a minute. They don't play baseball in December. And of course they don't. I'm talking about the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers National Football League. Most sports fans do not know that there used to be a Brooklyn Dodgers football team. They disbanded them at some time after World War II, but they were still playing. And so I was in, at the stadium in New York City where those two teams were playing. And at halftime, they interrupted, you know, uh, the normal stuff, and the guy got on and said, would the following people please call their office immediately? And then he started with this list, General so-and-so, Admiral so-and-so, and then he went into congressmen and senators. In other words, all these very important people were attending the ballpark. And lo and behold, call your home office. I was with a friend of mine, who incidentally is still a friend, and I still talk to regularly. Uh, I turned to Perk and I said, wow, something big is happening in the world. They're calling all these people. But they never told us why they were doing it until the very last play. And when the moment the last play of the game was finished, they came on and said, ladies and gentlemen, our country is at war. We've been attacked in Hawaii. There are many casualties. The attacks are still going on, and so on. And that's how I was introduced to World War II. The next morning, I wanted to help out. I was only 15, but I figured I might be able to lie about my age and get into the Marines. And I think this is especially important for the young people to know. I went down to the foot of Manhattan, New York, on the morning after Pearl Harbor, December 8th. I got down there at dawn. The sun had not come up. It was like 5 o'clock in the morning, something like that, when I reached the Marine Recruiting Office in New York. At that point, there was a line two blocks long ahead of me at dawn on the morning after we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. Just think about that. Those men, they probably went, they probably heard about the attack on the radio and went directly there to wait for them to open the recruiting office on Monday morning. Now, if there were that many men at the Marine Recruiting Office in New York, then you know that in every recruiting office in America, that men were lining up to go fight. And so here was our country, which had been totally against going to the war. But the minute the country was attacked, everybody was together and everybody was ready. And we have been continually at war since 2001. And there are some people here who are not a lot older than, than that. They were born maybe a couple of years before. They were babies when we went to war. In other words, this country has been at war basically through their whole life. Now, there was a survey a couple of weeks ago, actually, and there have been similar before that, that showed that half of the American people 
do not know a single person who has fought in any of our wars since 2001. Half of all Americans don't know one person who fought in Iraq or Afghanistan. Now let's compare that to World War II and you will see what the difference is when a country is at war and when it's kind of playing being at war. When you have nearly half the people not knowing anybody that was in the war, you're, the war is distant. Not very many people pay much attention to what goes on in those places. Nobody goes rushing home at night to look at the television news to find out the latest thing in Afghanistan where there still are Americans, or even Iraq where there's still a few thousand. So we can compare that to the United States during World War II. In 1940, the census showed we had about 131 million people. That's about a third of what we have today. Of that 131 million, you could figure it out, I, I broke it down some years ago, you probably had about 20 million males, 20 million men who were military age. They were somewhere between 18 and, and, and 44. About 20 million men. During World War II, over 16 million men served in the armed forces of the United States. That means that over 80% of all young men were out fighting the war. I don't think you could have found very many people that didn't know somebody that was fighting in that war, because everybody was in the war. You were in the war 24-7. Everything you did had to do with the war. I'll just just give you some idea of, of those numbers. When you're talking those kind of numbers, over 80%, just think what that meant to every family. Every family went to hear the news every night. Why? Because their fathers, their sons, their brothers, whoever, their husbands, were at war. So people wanted to know what was happening. If you walk down a street of Uvalde or any other city in America in 1942, 43, 44, if you had uh, 10 houses on a, on a street and you walked down that street and you took a look at the front of every one of those houses, you would have noticed that in the window of probably seven or eight or even nine houses, there would be a white flag hanging in the front window, about that big, that high, white with maybe dark blue or dark red trim, and in the middle of it would be a blue star. Well, that blue star meant somebody in this house is out fighting the war. And sometimes you had a couple blue stars. And sometimes you had a gold star. And if you had a gold star, that meant somebody in that house had died in the war. And in some places, they had more than one gold star. In one home in Waterloo, Iowa, they had five. The Sullivan brothers all died on the same ship when it went down, a cruiser out in the Pacific. As a result of that, they changed the rules on where they would allow people to serve because they never, ever wanted to have that kind of thing happen again where you would lose a whole family of kids. And so... But there were, there were postcards in New Jersey, because they used to hold maneuvers down at uh, Fort Dix, of, of guys, you know, in mock battles before we were in the war, and they would have trucks. And the trucks would have a sign painted on either side. And there would be a board, and then in big white letters, TANK, T-A-N-K. In other words, we didn't have enough tanks to go out and maneuver with the tanks. But you wanted to have maneuvers in which you taught the men how to handle themselves and, and, and so on when there were tanks in the battle. We didn't have any tanks, so we painted a tank on the side of the truck so that that was a make-believe tank. We had artillery, which would be logs, that was, was, was a make-believe cannon. That is how weak this country was when we went into World War II. And, and it took a, a lot to get us on the road, but wow, 
the, the production just went. The country went into a 24-7 situation. There were many, many cities that were around-the-clock cities. I was very fortunate. When I went down to, to join the Marines on, the, on that day, by the way, I reached the front of that line somewhere in the middle of the afternoon. And when I did, there was an old Marine sergeant. And he looked at me and he said, well, son, you want to join the war? And I said, yes, sir. He said, you want to join the Marine? I yes, sir. And he said, how old are you? Well, I'm not stupid. I wasn't going to say I was 15. I said, which was the age that you could get in? I said, 17. And he said, and he thought he would trick me. And he said, what's your birthday? And so I had been practicing the whole time <laughs> on the earth. To have, you know, move it back to you. November 17, 19, 25, uh, uh, 24. And uh, he went, oh, you just turned 17. And he said, well, that's great, son. Let me have your birth certificate. And of course, I didn't have a birth certificate. And the nice sergeant said, well, son, that's no problem. He said, you go home, get your birth certificate, and come back. And that's how my Marine, uh, 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 God, you know when you get to be an old person, suddenly a war doesn't do a career. <laughs> suddenly my Marine career went out, went out the window. Uh, and it was only, by the way, he probably saved my life because they were desperate for manpower at that point. I mean, they needed to get men ready to fight overnight. Anybody that would have been taken on December 8th, I guarantee you, they would have had me in a training camp within a couple of days. Small group of people who were even more unhappy than the guys that didn't get any mail. And that was the guys that got Dear John letters. How many of you know what a Dear John letter is? It's kind of interesting. Now, how many people under the age of 21 that know what a Dear John letter? Anybody under 21 in here that knows what a Dear John? None. There you go. All right. Uh, for, for the sake of those young people, a Dear John letter is a letter that says, starts out Dear John. Now, it could be Bill or Pete or GM, whatever. <clears throat> but for the sake of, the, of, of my illustration, Dear John. And it would say, Dear John, you know how fond I am of you. And we've had some wonderful times together. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you've been gone a long time, and things change, and our interests change. In other words, she's given this guy the, the, the road. Bye-bye, <laughs> it's been nice knowing you, and good luck. Now, when you hear it, Everybody reacts the way this group did. Most people smile, and you, and you remember, you, ah, you know, some, some guy, boss girl. It was, in some cases, exactly that, probably most. But some of them were dead serious. And so this guy got his dear John. He finally was finished with the war, and he was heading home. Got a dear John, and he jumped over and killed himself. And the reason I tell that story is because I've heard and read that young people in this country, even high school kids, there's suicides among them. And, and, and we just, we never had that kind of thought. It was just something that was beyond us. And when we start reading that, that kids in high school commit suicide over some, something that happens, it, it just breaks your heart. And, and what I want to bring to your attention, and this is aimed at the young people here, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. I'm going to repeat that. It is a permanent, a really permanent solution to a temporary problem. In the case of the guy on my LSD, he lost a girlfriend, and it was very sad, and I'm sure it hurt like hell. But you know what? If he would have changed ships, gone back to the United States, had he cursed and punched the side of the ship, and did whatever he had to do to get over his unhappiness, he would have got over it, I'm sure, very quickly and he would have gone back to the United States, and he would have found a better girl than the girl that ditched him, and he would have been married, and he would have kids, 
and if he was lucky enough to live as long as I have, he'd still be around, and he'd have his grandkids, and he'd have a wonderful life behind him. And he didn't because he made a terrible, terrible decision. And he made a, a permanent, permanent solution, a final solution to a very temporary problem. And so if you ever have any of your friends talking about suicide, my God, do something. First of all, tell them what I just said, and then go to people that are in a position to help get them out of that mood. And, and it can be done, because if you can just keep them from doing it in 99% of the cases, just keep it from happening within a day or two, and it'll never happen. Well, my name is Smith. It's Esposito. And the captain said, well, he said, well, I wanted to join, and I was too young, and I borrowed my neighbor's birth certificate. And if I get killed in the invasion, my insurance money is going to go to his mother. <laughs> so, so you've got to change the, the record. So what do you do if you're a captain in the middle of one of the biggest invasions in the history of the world, and you've got this guy on there, with, there's nothing to do. He's there, and he's going to be there. And so by the time they could do anything, I think he was a month short of being 17. So in their wisdom, the United States Navy decided, what the hell, we've trained him, he's out in the Pacific, we'll just change the name and we'll go from there. And just to give you some idea of the kind of stuff that Esposito did, one day we were anchored in some damn harbor somewhere out in the Pacific, midnight, and a huge explosion under the ship. And, and everybody, of course, woke up that wasn't on duty and went correct. We didn't know what to do. There was no, no GQ, there was no alarm, you know, to do anything. They didn't call us to the guns. All we know is what we just had an explosion. And so guys were running to their guns without being told. We figured somehow there's been a surprise attack. You know, we don't know any of it. And it turned out to be nothing else happened and except that one explosion. And it felt like it was picking the ship right out of the water. And eventually, everybody on the ship except the captain found out what happened. And that was Louis Esposito was on watch at midnight, and he got lonely. And, you know, he got bored. So what the hell, if you're bored, what do you do? If you're Esposito, you take a hand grenade, you pull the pin, you throw it out into the water as far as you can. <laughs> if you throw it into the tide, I sweep the damn thing back under the ship. And well, now it goes on with all that water pressure and it makes it feel like the ship. And it was typical. I mean, he was, he was doing something all the time that was like that. And, and by the way, he's the only man I have ever known that was in four services. I, I, I saw him many years after the war and he had retired, but he had been in the Navy and when his time was up in the Navy, he instead joined the Marines, and then he served a, a, a term in the Marines, and then he went to the Army. So he was in the Navy, the Marines, the Army. He got his 20 years and retired and got a job with the Coast Guard. And I would just close, I'm often asked, what was my role in World War II? You know, what did I do? And I always, I like to deal in fact. I don't, you know, want to deal with opinion. And there are three facts about my service in World War II that I, are worth talking about. One, there were thousands of battles in World War II, all over the globe, thousands. That's fact number one. Fact number two, I only fought one battle. I was in the Battle of Okinawa. And fact number three, after the only battle that I fought in, the enemy surrendered. Those are the facts, and, and, and you, you can make any conclusion you want. I'm not making any claims. You can't rule out coincidence. It's possible, I suppose, but those are the facts of my service. Anyhow, thank you very much for showing up on this.